Can we use artificial intelligence to track and even predict epidemics like COVID-19? And do our genes make us more susceptible to catching the virus? We're living in the so-called fourth industrial era where data science and algorithms are helping us find solutions to the world's most complex problems and informing researchers who are trying to stem further transmissions of COVID-19. Today we speak with two scientists who are working to improve health and beat diseases using bioinformatics. We have Hambam Professor of Seoul National University's College of Medicine and CTO of bioinformatics company Genealogy joining us from Seoul. Very good morning to you. Good morning. We also connect with Nima Mashiri, Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of California, San Diego. Thank you for joining us. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, let's start with you, Professor Hun. So one of your areas of specialty is genomics. And now genetic test kits that you take at home have been very popular recently um, over the past year. And they can even indicate how likely we are to have certain characteristics and even how, suscept how susceptible we are to certain health risks. Now, how do people's genes influence how their bodies react to viruses like COVID-19? Well, when the virus comes in, our body fights the virus by first recognizing the virus. There are special genes called HLA genes that provide this recognition system. When the HLA genes recognize the virus, they can signal the T cells to kill the infected cells. Interestingly, the HLA genes are highly polymorphic, which means that they are very different between people. Because of this, is people differ greatly in how effectively they can respond to certain viruses. For example, in 2010, there was a science paper that described that certain HLA types were related to the progression of HIV positive patients. For COVID-19, several studies were published this year. One study suggested that a specific HLA type called HLA-B1503 has the greatest capacity to recognize the COVID virus in the immune system. However, these studies are based on the computer analysis and therefore population sample confirmation is required. Overall, people expect the gene genomic component to play a huge role in the immune response to the virus. So really, Professor Han, um, how are bioinformatics and AI currently being used to help researchers overcome some limitations that they face in preventing and treating diseases? Human DNA is huge data made up of 3 billion letters. People know that DNA plays an important role in many diseases, but we still do not know which genes are responsible for many complex diseases. To understand the relationship between genes and diseases, we need to analyze the DNA data of hundreds of thousands of people, where the AI and bioinformatics techniques are essential. Recently, AI technology has made good progress in finding people in high-risk groups. These are people who are many times more likely to develop a certain disease than normal people. This information can be useful in disease prevention and monitoring. Aside from genomic data, researchers in the hospital are actively using the AI to interpret the clinical image and video data in many applications. And now, Professor Mashiri, let's get to you. Now, Dr. Han mentioned ways that uh, scientists are using monitoring for certain diseases using um, data science. And now you've been tracking the evolution of COVID-19. So we'd love to hear about um, some of the trends that you found interesting in your study. Yeah, so, so uh, um, in general, it's been a lot more recent of an advancement where we can tackle the spread of viruses by trying to sequence viral samples from uh, many different patients around the world and then we can estimate an evolutionary history from those viruses. And then when you overlay information about the patients onto that evolutionary history, you can actually track the spread of the virus throughout the world. Um, so one of the better efforts that's been leading this has been this uh, team called NextStrain, uh, who have been kind of releasing this real-time report about the spread of the virus throughout the world. Um, and then on my side of things, what I've been trying to do is come up with faster algorithms and faster tools to keep these types of analyses uh, scalable. So for COVID-19 specifically, I think there was a lot of comparisons people were making with influenza. 
Um, and with COVID-19, it actually, it seems to mutate roughly a fourth of the rate as influenza. We see that we have roughly twice as many mutations per time uh, in influenza compared to COVID-19, but the genome of influenza is roughly half the length. So if you normalize, it's roughly a fourth of the mutation rate uh, compared to influenza. Right, so while you say so you're tracking um, how fast the uh, virus is mutating, and well, Dr. Han, would there be any concerns that, you know, if COVID-19, if the virus mutates very quickly, is there a possibility that this could actually compromise the current efforts that are ongoing for vaccine development? Right. Recent reports suggest that the specific mutation code D614G made the virus more, more infectious. If the virus continues to mutate and evolve, it is entirely possible that the vaccine's effectiveness will change. It would be great if we could accurately predict the future evolution of the virus using mathematical modeling or computational tools. But this is a real difficult problem. Dr. Moshir is tackling this problem, probably he knows, but this is really hard because the mutations in any DNA position the virus can occur randomly and we have little chance of predicting which mutation will make the virus more contagious or not. So Dr. Mashiri, it sounds like you have a very challenging task there and well how are you helping efforts to track the evolution of COVID-19 and how does this help public health officials and also scientists who are developing drugs to treat and also prevent COVID-19? Sure, uh, so I'll start with kind of a thought experiment. So imagine that you're the leader of some city and you've seen some cases of COVID-19 in your city and you have to determine what is the right public health action to take? Should I monitor people within my city to try to prevent the spread of the virus within the city? Or do I think that the virus is coming from outside of my city and instead maybe I should be tracking uh, in, uh, people coming in and out of my city instead? So these are two very different public health uh, responses for all we know of just two people have the virus in my city. Uh, so this is precisely where the evolutionary tree comes in. If I can have a real-time report of the evolutionary history, the differences of where these people are placed on that evolutionary history can help inform that decision and kind of help actions uh, in the public health space. The problem is the only way for these types of analyses to be useful is if we can get them in real time. So as the virus is spreading and as people are getting infected, we need to be able to collect samples and continue expanding that evolutionary history. Uh, but the problem is the methods that are used to estimate these evolutionary histories, they scale extremely poorly with respect to the number of sequences. Uh, so for context, there's kind of two key algorithmic bottlenecks in the traditional workflow, and it can make the analysis take between days or even weeks uh, on a given data set of the current magnitude that we have for COVID-19 right now. Um, so what my lab has been working on is how can we make these key algorithms faster so that we can enable even more data sets to be added uh, in our analyses. And Dr. Mashiri, so uh, coming up with very fast solutions, of course, must be very important, but uh, what are you doing to optimize the accuracy of your experiment as well? So for the accuracy of predicting the evolutionary history, this is really strongly tied to the accuracy of the mathematical models that you use to estimate the evolutionary history. Uh, so there's also significant ongoing work to try to see how can we uh, capture the evolution of this virus in a mathematically sound way that actually captures reality. So we see that many of the sequences with COVID-19 are actually identical. Um, and what what problematic, uh, what this makes, uh, sorry, this makes the analysis a little bit more problematic because a lot of our, um, a lot of our kind of time series analyses of the virus require that the virus, if there's different sampling dates, has at least a few mutations. Um, so it, it overcomplicates, sorry, it, it makes the, the analyses much more difficult if we don't have these accurate realistic models. I see. Well, now, Dr. Han, you're now involved in a bioinformatics company uh, called Genealogy, which is applying artificial intelligence to genotyping. Could you tell us more about your technology and what progress you've seen in terms of accuracy? Our company has the AI technology to predict HLA genotypes from DTC genetic test data. Lots of people do direct to customer or DTC genetic tests from companies like 23andMe and Ancestry. 
when you do the test, you can download your genome data. However, for technical reasons, the DTC tests do not contain HLA genes. Our technology converts the downloaded genome data into high-resolution HLA genotypes with an accuracy of 97 percentage. Compared to the previous technology, our AI technology has reduced the error rate by half. So, what's the use of knowing your HLA? Well, HLA can be extremely useful in finding the right stem cell donor for blood cancer patients. If a blood cancer patient needs a transplant, a donor with matching HLA genes must be found. Our company has created a website called matchdonor.org where both patients and prospective donors can upload their DTC test data to easily find matches. Any volunteers who would donate their stem cells can come to this website and upload their genome data, which will greatly help patients find their matches. Right, so, Professor, so right now you're focusing on blood cancer, but do you, expand to exp uh, do you plan to expand into other diseases? HLA genes are also linked to the response to cancer immunotherapy, the development of autoimmune diseases, and the severe drug reaction. We are currently focused on blood cancer patients, but plan to expand the focus to other cancers by developing AI technology to predict the response to cancer immunotherapy. Our corporate vision is to help people with bioinformatics, and our first goal is to inform all people on Earth about their HLA. When everyone knows their HLA, many blood cancer patients around the world can find the right stem cell donor much, much easier. When this happens, it will greatly increase the overall recovery rate from blood cancer in the world. And Dr. Mashuri, so uh, what outcomes are you hoping to see from your current research on COVID-19 and tracking its evolution? And what is your vision for bio bioinformatics in viral research? Sure, thank you. So currently, we've already made some great progress on this front. Uh, we already took one of those two key bottlenecks that I mentioned, and we've made it go from taking days or weeks to run to now taking a matter of minutes or at most an hour. Uh, so already one of the kind of two key bottlenecks of these analyses we've solved. Uh, so in the future, we hope to approach the other challenge. Uh, there's an algorithm where given a bunch of sequences uh, actually predicting the evolutionary tree, this is still a very slow problem. And uh, with a fellow member of the faculty in the computer science department, uh, Tayana Rosing, we're working on developing hardware accelerated methods to speed up these analyses. And kind of the more broad applications that I'm interested in are hopefully if we can get these results quick enough, uh, if we can scan the genomes of the COVID-19, of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, and see what parts of the virus are mutating, I'm hoping that that information can inform uh, vaccine design. Maybe vaccines can be designed to target parts of the virus that mutate less quickly or are generally more stable across the population. So with this information, I'm hoping to uh, one day be able to benefit the uh, vaccine developers. And Dr. Mashuri, how do you think then, looking forward into the future, how do you think bioinformatics should or could be developed and actively used to prepare for future epidemics? So I think if we can set up a proper, so in general, to preface this answer, if you have a viral sample from a patient and you're able to sequence it, you can very quickly determine whether or not this person has the virus. Uh, the problem is sequencing is generally more expensive and slower than the traditional tests that are being used. But sequencing also scales very well. So if in the future we had the bioinformatics infrastructure to be able to do massive sequencing of anyone we suspect might have a future virus, it could help us get not only uh, diagnostic data, do they have the virus or do they not have the virus, but also it can help give us that genetic information about the virus itself at a much larger scale. So to enable this, we need the kind of the sequencing technology infrastructure, but also the computational analysis infrastructure to be able to enable this type of situation. And Dr. Han, before we go, what do you think should be done to prevent or minimize the scale of future epidemic outbreaks using bioinformatics? Bioinformatics can help people understand the inherent difference between people that is caused by their genome. In particular, bioinformatics can be developed to improve understanding of each individual's immune system. 
when we gain a full understanding of our immune system, and if epidemics start emerging, we can we can protect the people who are susceptible to viruses first and give them vaccines first. Based on our genomic information, we can also determine the right medicine and dosage for each individual in the early stages of epidemics. With this in mind, I expect that with the development of AI technology, humanity will be able to fight viruses more effectively and strategically. So really, it's very encouraging to hear about how you as scientists are really working to really aid humanity and help us really um, prevent future epidemics as well. Now, this is where we will have to end the discussion for today. But that was Han Bom, Associate Professor of Medicine at Seoul National University and CTO of Genealogy, and Nima Mashuri, Assistant Teaching Professor of Computer Science and Engineering at the University of California, San Diego. Thank you both so much for joining us. Thank you. Thanks for having me. And to our viewers, thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow with an analysis on the US presidential race, so don't miss that. And have a good one wherever you are. Goodbye.